which brings up the ITC itself. The ITC did a lot of work in helping us get the collection here, helping us set up the exhibit you saw last night if you were here, and helping us use this, allowing us to use the space, specifically Sarah Gold and the new director of ITC as of I think about three or four months ago, Angela DeCock. Next, Dr. Rick Tangham, you saw him a second ago at the podium. Rick helped organize the overall symposium and had general oversight from the Center for Urban and Regional Planning Research. We appreciate his efforts in making this happen as well. Bill DuPont, the director, and, and Claudia Guerra for the Center of Culture and Sustainability for their assistance and support in putting this together. I already mentioned the Institute for Economic Development, and I see Bob here today, the rural development portion of it for supporting and getting the speakers here and putting together this afternoon's activities as well. My assistant who's not here, Suzanne Willis, uh, pulled together all the logistics and process invitations and notices that you saw, so I really appreciate her help. It was a little hairy the last couple of weeks, so uh, she's not here, but that, that's okay. <laughs> but our most special thanks to our private sponsors. The primary sponsor, sponsor for the symposium is the San Antonio Conservation Society. And I just saw Bruce walk in, Bruce McDougall, Executive Director. Where's Bruce? In the back. Thanks so much, Bruce, for your huge support with this. Other donors included Hugh Fitzsimmons. I have not seen Hugh. Did he get here? I didn't think so. Okay, he drives quite a way. The Carter Family Foundation, Ford Powell and Carson, the firm, Boone Powell is an individual, and, and Chris Carson is an individual. Thank you so much for all you sponsors. If I've forgotten anybody, please forgive me. As you can tell, the list is, is very long, those people that wanted this to all come together and to happen. So thank you, everybody. Without your help, this wouldn't have been possible. So our sincere thanks. This time, I'd like to introduce to you somebody that many of you already know. I'm proud to say that Miss Sue Ann Pemberton Howe is a faculty member of ours in the College of Architecture, where she does an outstanding job teaching. However, she also does many other things and wears many other hats. I told her a minute ago the introduction may be longer than her comments, so you'll, you'll bear with me. Sue Ann Pemberton, FAIA, serves as the 47th president of the San Antonio Conservation Society. However, she has a long history of SAC's activity. She joined, joined the society in 1992 and since then has served as chair of the Steve's Homestead Scholarship and Grants Committee, Properties Restoration at La Vita Properties many times, Parade Activities, Brackenridge Park Special Committee, River Overlay Special Committee, Houston Street Design Guidelines Committee, and 18 other society committees. As an IOSA volunteer, she chaired or co-chaired the Canvas Banner Committee for the majority of 1992 to the present. Sue Ann believes that preservation is how you manage change, and the society can help retain the city's historical character while supporting growth and development. Another goal as president is to engage a younger, diverse group of people in the society, such as ULI, Young Leaders, and other organizations interested in the future of San Antonio. As I mentioned, Sue Ann is also a senior lecturer at the University of Texas San Antonio College of Architecture. She was recognized by the Power of Preservation for Education and Advocacy in 2012, and by, by me, the Dean of the College of Architecture at UTSA, for Outstanding Community Involvement in 2011. She was elevated to the College of Fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 2010 in recognition of her contribution to the preservation education. In 2009, she was awarded the Edward Romanak Award for Outstanding Contributions to Architectural Education by the Texas Society of Architects. She's actively involved in the community, the profession of architecture and preservation as the owner and principal of Main Street Architects Incorporated for over 30 years and was appointed by Mayor Castro to Hemisphere Park Area Development Corporation Board of Directors in 2009, where she serves as the Secretary of the Corporation. Please help me in welcoming Sue Ann. You can quit any time. <laughs> okay, well, we'll try to speed up after that one. Um, I have the, the privilege here of actually wearing many hats, many of them he's already mentioned, but um, I got to know Gene, uh, as I was a young architect out of grad school, and uh, he was kind of this larger than life character, and uh, it was one of those people that when he entered a room, uh, people listened, and that was pretty exciting. 
Um, I went to, uh, had the opportunity to go to Big Bend National Park with him as part of a National Park Service sponsored uh, event to kind of see what needed to happen there. And we met at a, uh, at, um, in Austin and flew on a private jet to, to Big Bend. And even there, things were, you know, kind of like in awe of Gene George. So it was a great opportunity to get to know him. In 1995, the Conservation Society established the Mary Ann Blocker Castleberry endowed professor position and at UTSA, and the primary goal was to get Gene George into that position. And so we, we managed to do that. And as a colleague, we, uh, he was easy to talk with, not talk to, because he always engaged you in the conversation. He listened to what you had to say, and we both had a passion for building documentation and for uh, photography, and that's, you can see in the exhibit upstairs. We continue to do that kind of work at UTSA as well. Uh, San Antonio Conservation Society is pleased to be a sponsor for this symposium, and I hope you enjoy the, not only the symposium, but the, the exhibit as well. It's long overdue that we have an exhibit of, of his work. Thank you. By 1760, my forefathers and foremothers were among many Spanish families who crossed the Rio Grande into Texas to establish ranches and communities. They brought with them the building and cultural traditions of Spain that were adapted and changed by their experience in the New World, the techniques of ranching, and the contributions of stock handling by vaqueros left enduring imprints on ranching in the United States that remain with us today. The Rio Grande Corridor from Brownsville to Eagle Pass has a rich legacy of significant historic buildings and places that are sadly being lost or degraded. This one day symposium focuses on the importance of these uh, historic cultural assets to the people uh, in the state of Texas. An important part of the symposium is of course the exhibit of the work of the architect Walter Eugene George who documented many of the historic buildings in this corridor through photographs and drawings. The presentations uh, today will explore the importance of the wide range of historic resources, including buildings, ranches, and communities, and ask the important question, what can be done to save and maintain this important legacy? What potential exists for cultural tourism? Our first speaker, Dr. Jesus de la Teja, is the Jerome H. and Catherine E. Supple Professor of Southwestern Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of the Southwest at Texas State University, where he also served as Chairman of the Department of History from 2005 to 2011. He was the inaugural State Historian of Texas from 2007 to 2009 and has served on the Board of Directors and as President of the Texas State Historical Association. He has uh, published extensively on Spanish, Mexican, and Republican era Texas, most recently, Recollections of a Tejano Life, Antonio Menchaca in Texas History, and an edited volume of biographies, uh, Tejano Leadership in Mexican and Revolutionary Texas. He has served as uh, book review editor for the Southwestern Historical Quarterly since 1997, and between 1990 and 2005, served as managing editor of the journal uh, of the uh, Texas Catholic Historical Society. He's a fellow of the Texas State Historical Association and the Texas Catholic Historical Society and a member of the Texas Institute of Letters and the Philosophical Society of Texas. His talk is an introduction to the, the Spanish borderlands. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Frank Delacroix. Well, I made it. So uh, I don't know that I've recovered from making it, but uh, we're, we're going to give it a shot. Thank you for, for having me be here this morning and, and for letting me lead off, uh, because that means that uh, people like Mario, who, sit, who follows me, gets to pick up all the pieces. Um, and I am going to leave a lot of pieces uh, lying around, because it's a really, really big topic. And um, since you don't have time to take my seminar, um, I have to try to do it very quickly. So um, again, I'm honored to be involved in, in honoring the memory and the legacy of, of Eugene George. 
who I had the privilege to get to know in Austin at the bi-monthly uh, breakfast gatherings known as the Austin Borderlands Breakfast, um, which was an offspring of the San Antonio uh, Borderlands Breakfast. A group up in Austin decided they didn't want to have to come down to San Antonio all the time. Um, so they decided to form one of their own. And uh, Gene um, regularly attended these, and I used to attend them a lot more regularly before I found that, that uh, life was taking me in too many directions at the same time, so I don't get to them as often as I can. So anyway, uh, my talk this morning is divided into two parts. Um, because I'm a historian, I can't get away from providing the historiographical framework and foundation for whatever it is I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'd like uh, to give a uh, very brief and incomplete and overgeneralized historiographical overview of the Spanish borderlands. Uh, and in the second part, uh, I'll paint the history of the southwestern borderlands in very broad uh, brushstrokes. Um, I, um, and conclude with a, with a few general observations. So um, bear with me. I, I think I'm going to leave plenty of time for any questions that you may have that I won't be able to answer. But if I can't, there's, there's, I, I look out in the audience and I see that there are probably other people who can't. So we're, we're in good shape. Borderlands history emerged about a century ago from the work of Eugene C. Bolton. Uh, I'm, Eugene. Herbert C. Bolton and his followers. Uh, he had been preceded by Hubert Howe Bancroft. Uh, but not being an academic, Bancroft uh, did not establish a school or make borderlands a field of study. Um, but Bancroft was an entrepreneur. He had his own publishing company in San Francisco. And he, and he actually created a workshop. And he had a number of people working for him combing Mexican archives, combing archives across the southwestern United States, and produced a series of histories, um, which were actually quite influential for a long period of time in that old romantic vein of the 19th century, um, where he actually would invent dialogue for people sitting around the table discussing uh, policy and whatnot, but he, a multi-volume multi history of the United States, a multi-volume was the end of the line because um, I guess once his workshop workers, his elves, stopped working for him, uh, they dispersed into the nether regions and were never heard from again. Um, and that left Bolton, who um, in fact uh, was a Turnerian. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner um, thesis turned out, of course, to be um, seriously flawed, um, as did Bolton's vision of the Spanish institutions shaping the frontier. But the point is that Bolton took off um, on, in, in, in rift on Turner and tried to apply it to what he saw was an alternative vision of things, and that was the, the Spanish influence um, in the New World. Uh, so Bolton and his followers focused on institutional history that emphasized the civilizing mission of Spain in the Southwest, missions, presidios, explorers, and conquistadors. The mission as a frontier institution was an article, extremely influential article that came out in the American Historical Review, became a classic in the field. As late as the 1940s, Bolton was going strong. He started at the University of Texas, uh, was spirited away from, by Berkeley, um, and, did, and had over almost 150 PhD students by the time he ended his career. So extremely influential in training people in doing um, southwestern um, borderlands history. And uh, as late as the 1940s, he was writing a biography of Coronado that he subtitled Night of Pueblos and Plains, with, which kind of gives you an idea of, of his view of, of these men. Curiously, uh, Bolton never produced a, th a true synthesis of borderlands history, although he came, he came close. He wrote something called The Spanish Borderlands, a chronicle of old Florida and the Southwest, and, and Yale published it back in 1921. Um, and it contains chapters on the conquistadors of the 16th century, followed by chapters on the individual provinces. So it was not a true 
synthesis in that he compartmentalized things. He didn't try to create an overarching uh, narrative other than what Spanish did was good. Uh, and it was good because it tried to civilize the, the, the savages, um, the, 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 the ne'er-do-wells, the, the uh, riffraff uh, that um, occupied this part of North America. Bo uh, Bolton students, uh, followed the master in looking at the borderlands in, in a rather narrow context, that is, in focusing on what happened in what eventually became the U.S. Uh, a number of these scholars produced works that touched on some aspects of borderlands history, either regionally, thematically, or chronologically. And there were plenty of specialized studies. One of Bolton's last students, Father John Francis Bannon, actually produced the first true synthesis of borderlands history, uh, the Spanish borderlands frontier, 1513 to 1821. It was published by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston in 1970. So between the work that uh, Bolton started at the beginning of the century, it took to 1970 to get a first real synthesis. Uh, but it too um, had the limitation of focusing uh, specifically on what happened um, north of the uh, Mexican border. It was, it was about Spain in what is, what was the, or what is the southern United States. The real leap forward came with Oka Jones's 1979 Los Paisanos, Spanish Settlers on the Northern Frontier of New Spain, which was published by the University of Oklahoma. And I recommend it to all of you because it was a, uh, titanic effort at synthesis based on fairly inadequate secondary sources and um, a uh, limited amount of archival work that he did. Um, and it's important, I think, for a number of reason, uh, reasons. First of all, uh, Jones was definitely not a Boltonian. Uh, he rejected the idea that the makers of Borderlands history were limited to missionaries, soldiers, and conquistador explorers. Uh, although his book was also not a comprehensive survey, it did two important things. It saw the borderlands as something that existed on both sides of the present U.S.-Mexico border, arguing that to understand the Hispanic populations of the southwestern United States, one needed to understand the corridors of settlement that brought people up from the northern Mexican provinces. Secondly, he argued that civilian settlement was as important as the institutions and explorers that had been the focus of previous historians. In fact, he stretched this point a little too far in the case of California, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, where, um, well, I'll explain in a little, when I go into my second part, I'll explain why that is. In essence, Jones modified the earlier Boltonian idea of looking at northward frontier expansion as a three-pronged enterprise. He divided the borderlands into four corridors. The eastern, which included Nuevo Leon, Coahuila, uh, Texas, and Coahuila. A central, Nueva Vizcaya, which are today's Durango and Chihuahua, and uh, Nuevo Mexico. The west, which included Sinaloa and Sonora, and the Pacific, which included the Californias, Baja and Alta. Jones's approach of taking settlers, the paisanos, seriously was based on the premise that there was actually a large population of Hispanic origin that represented the true frontier population, rather than the representatives of the institutions so central to the Boltonian vision. The 1980s and 1990s saw scholars of the region draw increasingly away from the Boltonian predilection for missionaries and soldiers. One example is Gilberto Hinojosa's uh, study of Laredo, uh, which starts with the community's founding and goes through the coming of the American Civil War. Socioeconomic and demographic issues are features uh, in the work, are important features in the work, uh, which ideally studies a community that pre-existed American annexation of Texas on both sides of the Rio Grande. In fact, uh, my own work on San Antonio uh, for my dissertation at UT back in the 80s 
and uh, the subsequent book, uh, San Antonio de Bejar, a community on New Spain's northern frontier, which I'm very happy to say won a, won a accommodation from the San Antonio Conservation Society, um, and appeared in, in 95, uh, owed a lot to Jones's approach. Looking at the elements of community building, I made the missions intentionally peripheral uh, to my study, while noting how the Presidio and the civilian communities existed in a symbiotic relationship. So I, I brought the Presidio back center, front and center, but in a different way uh, from the Boltonians. I, I looked at the Presidio in terms of how it assisted in community development. More importantly, my community study and other local and area studies, um, uh, much more important than those, was David Weber's wonderful synthesis, The Spanish Frontier in North America, published by Yale in 1992. Incorporating a comprehensive analysis of the literature, along with pinpoint archival work, and relying even on archeological and anthropological studies, if you can believe that a historian would rely on archeological and anthropological studies, Weber's sweeping analysis of the development of the Spanish borderlands attempted a new balance. Importantly, Weber tried to um, balance the story by assuming a kind of neutrality that turned old assumptions into points of debate. Hence, he offered such attitudes as uh, referring to the Spaniards God or the God of the Spaniards. Uh, he didn't assume a Western European ethos and therefore it wasn't God. It was somebody's God. Um, there might be other gods. He was critical of the institutions that the Boltonians had seen as the essence of the Spanish civilizing mission without being dismissive of them. He took them seriously, but he didn't bow down to them. Unfortunately, the sheer size of the undertaking meant that the boundaries of the borderlands uh, in Weber's work, once again, retreated. Uh, David's North America was the equivalent of the southern uh, part of the United States. Not that Weber did not see the bigger picture. He not only understood the broader dimensions of the borderlands, but was willing to support that exploration. Thus, when I came to him with the idea of scholars from the eastern and western borderlands actually collaborating on something, uh, who would have thunk? Um, in an effort to uh, develop um, a kind of a more cohesive way of looking at the Spanish borderlands uh, from new perspectives. Um, he encouraged me and, and Ross Frank at the University of California, San Diego to, to go for it. Uh, the result was our edited volume, Choice, Persuasion and Coercion, Social Control on Spain's North American Frontiers, uh, published by New Mexico in 2005 with chapters on Florida, Louisiana, Nuevo Santander, Coahuila, Nueva Vizcaya, and Sonora, as well as um, Texas, New Mexico, and California. Um, central to the work of Weber and the scholars uh, present among the contributors to choice persuasion and coercion and many others who have followed, um, is a concern for social history and the presentation of the borderlands as a zone of interaction that created unique cultural expressions of place. Thus, two of the uh, very different works, uh, Medieval Culture and the Mexican-American Borderlands by Milo Kearney and Manuel Medrano, published by A&M Press in 2001, and Captives and Cousins, Slavery, Kinship, and Community in the Southwest Borderlands, um, published by the University of North Carolina in 2002, could tackle issues of the roles of Europeans and indigenous practice and norms and remind us of the complexities of these peripheral places. Um, they are, uh, in other words, um, they are places where the old world and the new world certainly met, uh, but they were also where the concepts, the, precon the, the preconceptions, the ideologies, uh, the ethos of those two worlds came and, and blended together. Omar Valerio Jimenez's very recent River of Hope, Forging Identity and Nation in the Rio Grande Borderlands, 
uh, published by Duke last year, that is 2013, continues to push the boundaries of borderlands community studies in the areas of gender, local identity, and race. I could go on with the historiographical survey, um, but let's consider uh, what does all of this mean uh, for us here today, and I apologize if I didn't mention uh, one of your favorite books. I left a lot of stuff out, uh, but I wasn't gonna let, leave me out, obviously. Um, as a student of the built environment, uh, Eugene George worked with the architectural handiwork of the very settlers, paisanos, colonos, pobladores, uh, who had been of such little importance to the story until the last decades of the 20th century. Um, and one need only read the opening chapters of, um, of uh, Ferencamp's Lone Star to see just how dismissive um, mainstream American culture was of these people. Um, with all due respect. <laughs> As we like to say in Jersey, before we insult you. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, so for the rest of my time this morning, uh, what I'd like to do is take you through a brief overview of the history of that Spanish-Mexican frontier, the preservation of a portion of which is uh, Jean's uh, legacy. Let's start with the Coronado expedition, which Richard and Shirley Flint and their students have so thoroughly studied in the last 20 years or so. Uh, according to Richard Flint in uh, No Settlement, No Conquest, a History of the Coronado Entrada, published by uh, New Mexico in 2008. The emphasis on exploration and the quest for rich riches has obscured the real goal of the expedition, of the Entrada, and that was settlement. It was, and, and so we have the case of, of um, a failed settlement effort, not a failed expedition to find gold and silver and, and other riches. Um, and, and so he says once there wasn't, um, there didn't seem to be the propitious circumstances for settlement, the expedition withdrew. All right, so it's a different way of looking at it other than what we normally get in, in the classroom, that uh, God, gold, and glory attitude that it's just a, a rapine search for, for uh, uh, taking whatever you can as quickly as possible. Um, sort of um, 16th century version of corporate raiders. Um, some of these jokes aren't working this morning. Uh, <laughs> they, oh, well. Um, you, you, there is coffee. <laughs> it was another 50 years before pobladores returned to New Mexico, this time under Juan Doñate. Uh, but by then, the colonial frontier had taken on some order. Spanish expansion northward out from the former domains of the Nahuas, the Otomis, and the Tarascans in the 1520s and 1530s had at first been a process of gathering slaves and opening farms and pastures. And the taking of Indians as slaves continued even after the crown decreed conclusively otherwise in the 1570s, eventually becoming a cultural practice that led to the Genizaro population of New Mexico and the adopted Indian servants adopted. Indian servants, uh, or criados of, of Texas. By the late 1540s, the frontier had another motive, the one that we are most familiar with and, as in the case of Coronado, one which obscures other patterns of behavior. The mother load strike in, at Zacatecas began a silver rush comparable in many respects to the California gold rush of 1849. Silver may have been the driving force of exploration from the 1540s onward, and sure enough, the Sierra Madre Occidental proved fertile ground for precious metal miners, but silver mining never employed a significant portion of the population, even in its heyday. Miners and their beasts have to be fed. Mines have to be developed and worked, ore has to be transported and processed, and silver has to be minted and shipped. In these activities is where you'll find the vast majority of pobladores. Regions such as what eventually became Durango and Southern Coahuila became the breadbaskets of the mining districts. 
As demand for livestock increased, resourceful ranchers and great and small stock, um, and great and small took flocks and herds in new directions. Arid as it was, and um, resistant as the native peoples of the Gran Chichimeca were, and there was a 50-year war between the Chichimecas, or the people that the Spanish called the Chichimecas, and Spaniards in uh, northern New Spain until it was brought to an end at the end of the 16th century by a very wise viceroy who decided he'd bribe the Indians. And uh, bribing the Indians became pretty standard factor, um, practice when you, when you couldn't put them in missions uh, and when you couldn't subdue them militarily, you bribed them. Um, and it was a policy that became very effective in the late 18th century, but that's another story. Um, and as I say, Hispanic, um, th his, uh, when, I, when I talk about Hispanic, I'm talking about Hispanic settlers who were pushing northward, and I say Hispanic because although they were Spanish in the sense of being Spanish subjects, they were by the latter part of the 16th century already a mix of Spaniards, Indians, Africans, and all manner of mixed bloods. The Mestizo North was coming into being. If we stop to consider the American Western frontier, we realize that in 1848, the orderly westward movement of the United States was disrupted by the great leap to the West Coast. In the decades that followed, the American frontier moved in two directions as came to be symbolized by the transcontinental railroad, part of which was built from the east and moved west, and part of it was built from the west and moved in east, and they met in the middle. In other words, what we typically think of as the American West was mostly backfill. Just so in Mexico, where particular justifications brought about great leaps beyond the natural line of settlement and then backfill. At the end of the 16th century, Oñate drove his soldier settlers and their Indian servants into what is today the Rio Arriba region of uh, New Mexico, leaving a gap of hundreds of miles to the native peoples of the desert region on both sides of the Rio Grande as he tried to find the next rich bonanza and had to settle for a lot of little poor farming outposts. By the middle of the 17th century, a mission civilian community had emerged at Paso del Norte, which by the early 18th was a mixed community of farmers with a thriving viticulture and ranchers who made a living supplying mules for the caravans that moved up and down the Jornada del Muerto, separating Spanish New Mexico and Spanish Chihuahua. And by the way, it's one of those interesting stories that hasn't gotten the attention that it should, but um, they were making wine and brandy in the El Paso area by the early 18th century. The, the region was tremendously productive in that way, and um, it hasn't gotten scholarly attention. I don't understand. It, you, you'd think people would be interested in booze. Um, to the west, Sonora's slowly expanding mining, ranching, mission frontier eventually brought Spanish subjects to what is today southern Arizona. Occupation of the area remained tied to Jesuit missions until the order's expulsion from Spanish dominions, uh, domains in 1767, and then under the Franciscans. To protect their, uh, the religious um, in their work, a couple of presidios represented Spanish civiliz civilization on the Sonoran, on the far northern Sonoran frontier. To the east, the settlement of Texas may have begun with missions and presidios, but within a few years, a thriving community of civilian settlers existed at San Antonio, where in 1731, they were joined by a small group of Canary Islanders who formed the first chartered civil settlement in the province. Half a century later, military civilian communities were well established not only at the province's capital of San Antonio, but in East Texas at Nacogdoches and on the coastal plain at La Bahia. All three areas of settlement were mixed communities of mestizos, mulatos, and Hispanicized Indians with a smattering of authentic Spaniards and many others who claimed Spanish status. In fact, the secularization of San Antonio's missions and the reduction of La Bahia's meant a boon to local would-be ranchers who from the mid-1790s began claiming for, uh, former mission ranches and therefore 
um, the ice, what I call the oasis settlements of Texas began to spread out into the countryside, backfill. It wasn't an orderly movement. It wasn't an orderly occupation. It was oases of settlement from which Spanish influence could then radiate out as condition permitted. The settlement of Texas, a geopolitical response to French encroachments from Louisiana had, although for very different reasons, also left a large gap between Spanish settlements in Texas and the rest of the frontier, which lagged behind by hundreds of miles in Coahuila. Uh, and it's from Coahuila that many of the early Texas settlers hailed. In fact, even within Spanish Texas, the region between San Antonio and Nacogdoches was essentially still Indian territory at the end of the 18th century. The backfill in the case of Texas came in the form of José de Escandón's great colonizing venture. As a matter of fact, unlike Texas, New Mexico, or California, the province of Nuevo Santander, which began to take shape in the late 1740s, was officially named Colonia de Nuevo Santander. As in the case of Texas, New Mexico's Santa, uh, uh, Nuevo Santander settlement was a defensive response to increasing Indian threats to settlements on the western slopes of the Sierra Madre Oriental and to potential English encroachments along the Gulf Coast, those pesky Englishmen. And, and you may think that that threat might seem preposterous to you, except the, the English had established themselves down in Belize. So they had occupied Spanish territory and there was no way the Spanish could dislodge them. So they were determined to occupy what is today coastal Tamaulipas in order to prevent that from happening again. Because they knew once the English arrived, they were gonna stick. They weren't going anywhere. Um, Escandon uh, established towns, mining camps, missions, and handed out large tracts for ranches uh, to some of the major contributors, the major donors, if you will, to his enterprise. Some of the grants were made to immigrants from Spain. But many of the settlers of early Nuevo Santander, including the Rio Grande settlements, were pobladores from adjoining regions of Nuevo León, Coahuila, San Luis Potosí, and the Huasteca. From the very beginning then, Nuevo Santander was a true colonization enterprise that relied on civilian settlers. You won't find the kind of mission establishments that you see in the San Antonio area or down at La Bahia, you don't find those along the Rio Grande. It was a very different type of uh, movement. And even with his great enterprise, the gap between Texas and Nuevo Santander, which Escandón hoped to bridge by moving La Bahia to the San Antonio River while he founded a new town on the Nueces River, remained for many years the home of nomadic tribes. In other words, even bridging the gap between Texas and Nuevo Santander uh, proved uh, rather difficult and it didn't really materialize until the 1830s. Up until that time, um, essentially the, uh, the Trans uh, Nueces region, as it's called, was uh, a ranching expansion from the north um, and very little movement from the Texas side. So it was, it was these pobladores from Nuevo Santander and then after independence, Tamaulipas, who were moving northward. I used to, when, I, when we used to go to the beach down at uh, Padre Island and I got the family in the car, every time we crossed on 37, every time we crossed the Nueces River, I would say we're in Tamaulipas now. Um, and it'd be an opportunity for a history lesson that the kids would soon turn off. Um, but anyway, um, just like Texas and Nuevo Santander, California proved to be a geopolitical leap beyond the natural frontier line. The threat of Russians and Englishmen establishing bases so close to New Spain forced Spain's hand to overextend itself one last time. Although established as a missionary military frontier, by the 1790s, civilian settlements such as Nuestra Señora de los Ángeles, today's Los Angeles, California, which in 1800 had about 650 people, <laughs> um, and was the largest civilian settlement in California. Right? Uh, San Jose and Branciforte um, had made uh, an appearance. Those were the three 
civilian settlements of uh, California. Unlike the other provinces so far discussed, Hispanic California truly suffered from isolation. Yuma Indians cut off overland access by the end of the 1780s, and seaborne communication with the Mexican mainland proved difficult in the age of sail. Uh, the currents flow southward, so it's easy to go from California down to Mazatlan and Acapulco and so forth, but getting back means you essentially have to sail out into the middle of the Pacific, uh, Pacific and hope you catch a cur uh, winds that'll bring you back to the California coast. So it's an iffy proposition. So maintaining California when you couldn't reach it overland and when it was very difficult to reach by sea meant that it was truly cut off. So nobody, nobody, if nobody wanted to go to Texas, and uh, I like to tell the story of uh, Go Governor Domingo Cabello when he was assigned to Texas. He, he was coming from Central America. He stopped in Mexico City. He's reprovisioning. And uh, when he gets to Texas, he writes a letter. He says, I, I lost my cook in Mexico City because he, he, he heard that the Indians in Texas ate people. So he quit on me. All right. Um, um, he was almost right. Um, but it, it was difficult to get people to come to Texas. It was even more difficult to get people to go to California. So um, uh, there's only a handful of ranches that are distributed during the Spanish colonial period. The, the great fluorescence of, of Mexican, um, of California is during the Mexican period. Um, there would be no backfill from California then. Um, settlement remained along the coast. The interior belonged to the autonomous tribes that successfully resisted uh, Spanish efforts to bring them into uh, the mission fold. Um, instead, um, California became a living fossil uh, of, um, of mission um, activity. Uh, and I say living fossil because the Spanish crown as a policy had pretty much abandoned the idea of expanding through missionization, except in California. Um, by the time of Mexican independence, over 20 missions flourished in the province, uh, hard at work, turning thousands of native peoples into the laboring mass of Californiano population that Anglo-Americans would come to exploit a quarter century later. Um, California then um, is, is kind of an outlier. Um, it had a population, uh, a civilian population that was uh, at independence was slightly smaller than Texas and Texas had a small pop civilian population. Nevertheless, all the accoutrements of, of Spanish life existed because of the presidios, because of the missions. I'd like to sum up um, by making a couple of points. First, nowhere throughout Spain's western borderlands was there a pure Iberian presence. The Canary Islanders, themselves not really Spaniards by Iberian standards of the time, I hate to let the Can Canarios today know that uh, they, the Canary Islanders were actually looked down upon. Um, uh, the Canary um, settled among the Mexican pobladores of the Presidio. The Spaniards who joined Escandon's enterprise likewise settled among families from throughout New Spain's northern provinces. Despite their protests that Governor Vargas brought pure-blooded Spaniards to New Mexico, uh -uh. many of the Nuevo Mexicanos were of Nuevo Vizcaya stock. Um, and in California, contrary to what the Zorro movies and the state's tourism industry would have you believe, the Hispanic settlers were definitely of mixed racial uh, stock. Uh, they were Indian as well as Spanish. Um, they were, um, they were, uh, as uh, Jose Vanconcelos uh, referred to another set of circumstances, but they were what he called um, a cosmic race. They were a blending of the old and new worlds. Uh, second, throughout the borderlands, life was shaped by interaction with native peoples, both those that had been incorporated into the mission system and those that had retained their autonomy and chose how to respond to the Spanish presence. The movement of acculturated mission Indians into Hispano society created a core Mexican population, uh, civilian settlers in time, certainly in California that's the case. Uh, captive Indians baptized into Spanish households in Nuevo Santander, Texas, 
New Mexico, and, Cal and California, con uh, constituted an additional thread in the weave of this mixed frontier society. Just as Indians learned from pobladores, so pobladores learned from Indians, as stories of the tracking, hunting, tr and trading practices, uh, even on the um, napping of flints, uh, which from archeological evidence, it's clear that the Spanish population was making use of, of Indian ways of, of doing things, of Indian pottery and so forth. So there, there's plenty of evidence for this, this uh, exchange uh, and this creation of a very different uh, cultural milieu. Third, social mobility on the frontier was the product of circumstances and shouldn't necessarily be thought of as representative of a more egalitarian society. It is quite clear that pobladores subscribe to the mainstream tenets of Spanish colonial society. Racial passing was not a result of greater equality uh, between the races, uh, if you will, to put it in modern parlance, but a necessary adaptation. Royal policy that required soldiers to be Spanish meant that recruits were classed as Spanish, whether their physical characteristics were Spanish or not. Um, it, we needed Spanish soldiers, by God, you're a Spanish soldier. Um, passing oneself uh, off as Spanish was a way to adjust to uh, social and economic realities. But if you wanted to insult someone, you used a racial epithet. Um, mulatto dog was fighting words. And this is repeatedly seen in the records. Fourth, while some Spanish pobladores certainly were able to exploit the labor of Indians, especially in 17th century New Mexico, where the encomienda system was introduced long after it had become moribund in the rest of New Spain. Of course, it went away after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Uh, by and large, pobladores were working stiffs. Farming, ranching, a craft, and mule skinning uh, were occupations for all. This is where real equality existed. Very few frontiersmen could afford to keep their hands clean. And fifth, there was, until the very end of the colonial period, an acceptance of being part of the Spanish Empire, of being Spanish. In fact, the very presence of people who either rejected or were oblivious to the empire, the autonomous indigenous populations throughout the borderlands, meant that the Spanish identity all made Spanish identity all the more valuable. Being Spanish, Catholic, Spanish-speaking, urban-dwelling was civilized. While being Indian, pagan, native language-speaking, and nomadic were all traits of barbarity. Thus, along the borderlands, pobladores, um, Oka Jones's paisanos, recreated the material, social, and religious culture of their Spanish civilization to the best of their ability, even as they adapted to circumstances by adopting such native practices as contributed to survival. Um, in the process, they created homelands that make the American Southwest the unique places, not place, but places, they remain to this day. Thank you very much. can't tell, but do we have time for questions or? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's, an, it's, it's a matter of approach. Uh, and the question is, how, do, how does the borderlands tie into uh, an emerging view in scholarship of an Atlantic world? Um, and, and certainly, uh, the borderlands are peripheral to that Atlantic world, but they're, they're certainly part of it. And you, you can't escape uh, the fact that, um, that the pobladores think of themselves as, as Europeans. As I said at the end of my talk, uh, they, they relate to things from a Spanish perspective. Um, they may have adopted um, Indian, or they may be using Indian pottery. 
they may have learned Indian uh, techniques in tracking and in hunting and in doing this or that, but they identify themselves as Spaniards. They are continually reminded of that Atlantic world because throughout the borderlands, when the king dies and a new one's coming into place, the order goes out to celebrate, and they celebrate in a Spanish fashion. Um, on a yearly basis, um, when they have their, their uh, local feasts, uh, they, they actually recreate the Moros y Cristianos uh, ceremonies uh, and rituals of, of Spain on the frontier. Uh, even um, to the point of, of where you say, okay, wouldn't it be easier to recreate this in terms of Spaniards versus Indians? But they don't do Spaniards versus Indians. They do, they do Moros y Cristianos, Moors and Christians. So they, they, they are reinforcing um, that, that Atlantic um, perspective. And that Atlantic perspective is one that is essentially Spanish and Mediterranean. So it's a particular flavor of, of that Atlantic perspective. So, so it certainly is, we have to keep it in mind. We can't, and I think um, when we deal with uh, institutions, um, they're certainly Spanish, but how do they reflect the reality of everyday life? And what I'm saying is, what I find in my own work for Texas and what others have found in other places is that it is reflected in everyday life. People, I, and, and for, good, for, for good reason. You don't want to be an Indian. You don't want to be savage. You don't want to be barbaric. You're fighting these people all the time. Um, so what do you relate to? You relate to what is meaningful, and what is meaningful is where you came from, your roots. Uh, these, and, and these people consider themselves Spaniards even when they're not. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Okay, uh, the question was motivation for people from Nueva Vizcaya to move up into, the, into New Mexico, into the Rio Arriba, because it's essentially we're talking about the upper part of New Mexico that settled during the colonial period. The lower portion is essentially um, much more difficult to live in, and so it's, it doesn't really get filled out until much, much later. Uh, and, and essentially it's the same thing that's going on in other places. Um, people, um, for whatever reasons, uh, find their op opportunities limited wherever they live. And so they, the, the search for opportunity takes them to places um, where there are resources for them. And so um, if you're willing to take the risk of going up to New Mexico, there's a good chance that you can get your own plot of land, that you can establish your own farm, that you can establish your own little ranching operation, that you can be, um, that you can make something of yourself. Um, and it doesn't attract a lot of people uh, because a lot of people, as even today, right? There are places in this country where there are plenty of jobs, but there are, there are a few people. And yet there are plenty of places where there's a lot of people and few jobs and you don't get that population moving because there's always that resistance to move around. So there, but um, in fact, um, the, the, and, and by the way, New Mexico is the most successful of the borderlands provinces. Uh, it's got over 50,000 Hispano settlers there uh, by the beginning of the 19th century. It's able to create its own uh, local um, uh, culture in ways that doesn't happen in either Texas or California um, or even in Nuevo Santander. There is, there is an artistic expression to that culture that doesn't exist elsewhere. So New Mexico, and again, that blending of the Pueblo and the Spanish that uh, after the Pueblo Revolt has to take place on very even terms, right? The, after the Pueblo Revolt, the Pueblo Indians said, okay, you can come back and, and we'll be part of the Spanish Empire again, but these are the conditions. So it's not an unconditional uh, defeat for the Pueblos. Um, so the people who are coming from Nueva Vizcaya and whatnot, who are themselves pioneers or the, or the, or the, um, the descendants of pioneers of Nueva Vizcaya, are, um, are, are the most hardy, are the most intrepid, and so they're limited in number. Uh, and so that's the quickest answer I can give you. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.